Pip, pip, yeah! Hey everybody, welcome again to another episode of the ADHD Shop. I'm Ash the Engineer with more projects than common sense. And if you're like me and are stuck behind a desk all day, you find yourself always dreaming and hardly driving. So, all five of you have asked where I've been over the last couple of months, and the honest answer is, I just had surgery on my hip, so I really couldn't set foot in the shop for this last month or so. So I figured, you know, now might be a good time to do what everyone else does on YouTube. What the? Or sit and grow out the sweet beard and summarize what I've had done over the last couple months. In typical Ash fashion, what starts as one project ends up being no less than 15 projects as I mentioned in the last episode. So I've summarized all of my activities over the last few months in an episode I'd like to call the I really need to strap a camera to my head because this crap only happens to me special. We started off with a nice note wedged in the door jam of the shop. The note was placed at the beginning of our lockdown, so I hadn't been there for a while so I hadn't seen it for a few months. I called the landlord to confirm that since multiple months have passed, I only had a few days to clear the front of the building. Since I've been really fortunate to have this space for the last few years, I figured I definitely needed to act on this. Seems simple enough, right? The note was referencing a few driveway ornaments I had in the front of the garage. The first was a 1991 BMW 318iS I had found back in 2017. I had found this for the M42 engine, transmission, and subframes. But, of course, it had a cracked oil pan and busted front from the previous owner, who probably curved it trying to drift it or something, so who knows what condition that motor's in. And then we had my trusty trailer, we'll get into that one a little bit later. And last but not least, the 1988 GMC R3500 that had been sitting in the middle of a field just a few miles south of those Northern California fires a few years back, and the damage to show. Growing up in the 80s, I couldn't stop watching shows like The Fall Guy, and I always had a soft spot for square-bodied GMCs, especially the big end of the group, the Crew Cab Dually. This is another project that hopefully will get a Cummins 6BT with an NV4500 or a 5600, and I properly named it Candy. Why the name of a stripper from the Midwest, you ask? Well, clearly those toe and hips. This meant I finally had a timeline to pull the parts I needed from that E30 and somehow wedge a 21-foot truck into the shop that is filled to the brim. Something had to go. Luckily, my shopmate had a sweet, all-original 1946 Willys Jeep that he needed to sell. This could free up some space, I thought, and I thought I had nothing better to do, so I helped sell it. This is the first year of the civilian version after the war and came complete with a PTO. If I didn't have the FJ40, I totally would have kept this, but the stars aligned and after a little bit of time, we found a buyer. That was easy, right? Well, of course, super nice buyer wasn't able to arrange for towing it within a decent amount of time, and that didn't work with my time constraint. So I figured, hey, I can tow it to him as he wasn't too far away. Which brings us back to the trailer. The trailer which had served me so well for so long, but got into the hands of a friend hauling an ultra-rare NSU Prince from Oregon, who, unfortunately, had loaded the trailer incorrectly, with all of the weight at the tongue of the trailer. Trailer Loading 101, folks. Let's start with a level truck and a level trailer. When you have both connected, your truck suspension may be slightly loaded in the rear. Now let's drop a big weight on the trailer right above the axle. If you move that weight towards the front, your weight on the tongue significantly increases which puts more load on your truck axle, frame, suspension and brakes, and more load for your transmission and engine. You can destroy everything. If you go to the other direction, you'll have the same issues along with awkward and unsafe driving. Shift that weight back so you're about 60% in the front of the axle and 40% in the rear, and when your truck is somewhat level again. So as a result of that, the front axle of the trailer failed and it took out the brake and the hub. Ah, remember the while I'm in there's? Everything was getting old and tired so on a tight budget, I had to put on new axle hubs and bearings, fresh coat of rust inhibitor, fresh wiring and taillights, new jack, new pressure treated wood, new extra long ramps with rollers so I can roll them along the bed of the trailer much easier and long enough for all these low cars. Once that was all done, I was finally able to tow the Jeep. Sweet, another car out of the shop. Oh wait, I was setting up a new rack for additional storage inside of the shop, which meant everything was scattered on the ground. The final hope, of course, was to get everything located and organized. So now one spot opened up and I needed to open up another spot and this was being occupied by my buddy's freshly painted E30 M3 that's worth pretty much more than my life. Once he and I were able to move it and safely get it out, 
We now had the fun task of getting Candy inside, where he luckily helped. See, that's what the old school car community and friends are all about. Now, how do you get a near 21 foot, 2 ton truck with deflated tires inside the shop and be able to move it around when necessary, while on a tight budget? A forklift that I luckily won at a work auction a few years back, and another thing that I had to fab up which were wheel dollies wide enough for a dually. After all of that was sorted, I finally now had two spaces that opened up and I was able to play car Tetris again and shoehorn candy and the E30 parts car inside. I can now finally raise the E30 to a point that doesn't strain me and still have access to the gantry that I rigged up also. This was now a chance for me to work and finally part it after three years. Since I've been unemployed now for a bit, I've been scrounging around for whatever money I can get, which includes side jobs like this gate I repaired for my best friend for almost 30 years, as well as working for my friend in the real estate lending world which gave me a cool perspective of things and a couple of bucks. Finally, there was a break in the action where I got a chance to go to a local, socially distanced Shelby Car Club meet with one of my other buddies and one of the greatest wellers I've known for the last 20 years since school. Yeah, these are all real and easily in the seven figure range. I also finally went on the first local car meet in a long time with the Opal, since it's the only car that's run in about six years. Then we took a little road trip in the Element where we drove through the Bonneville Salt Flats. I think we hit a whopping 50 miles an hour. Once we got home, I was putting our stuff away till I realized our garage was a mess. Finally had a chance to organize our little work area there. Oh, and make way for my 1969 BMW 2002 that had been sitting in my mom's driveway for the last four years. Oh, and a rear quarter panel to put up on our new rack for a rainy day. After all that, I started working in the shop towards organizing and cleaning again as well as finally getting to start to work on my rotisserie with the materials that I'd bought since, I think, 2014 completely with fully adjustable height and length with air over hydraulic cylinder ram. Well, until I got to the rotisserie part, things were going well. The design calls for a rotating shaft to be pressed into pillow blocks. When I tried doing that, I destroyed our hydraulic press. Since most of the hydraulic presses on the market are outrageously expensive, I decided to take matters in my own hands and spend more time and more money in making my own. So the rotisserie was back on hold. Ah, back to the E30 finally got the front and rear subframes out and everything else I needed before I scrapped the chassis. Oh, but wait! The 69 is on the trailer! Ah, well luckily that was meant to be put right where the E30 was, so perfect. Oh, but wait again, there was that Mini that I was going to use for that EV conversion. Well, now it's time to be creative. Oh, but wait again! How do I get a car with no wheels or subframes onto a newly rebuilt trailer? Well, a combo of gantry and forklift, of course. How do I transport it home safely? Shh, ain't none of your concern. Now the E30 318 IS is the lightest of all the E30s and is a great candidate for race cars or engine swaps like the S52 E30 that I stupidly sold after my back surgery in 2018 and I just can't take it to the recycler. So coupled with being broke, I posted it on Facebook Marketplace where we all know how that unfolds. Luckily someone reached out and was about 15 minutes away. It was a little bit of a loss, but whatever, it's done. Ah, but you'd think that would go without a glitch, right? Nope, the cap on the trailer hub that holds the grease popped off and blew a hub. Well, the trailer's busted again, rotisserie's on hold, let's see what else I can do. I've had the CNC plasma system for about 10 years that completely rusted out, so I thought, hey, let's just jump on my trusty computer and start a CAD drawing for a new table. Oh wait, apparently Microsoft can't design a battery management system that prevents batteries from expanding and grenading my computer. After three attempts at buying a replacement battery, each of which was a wrong battery, the fourth one came in and the computer still didn't work. Guess I can't do any drafting, so back to the shop to see what I can do that doesn't involve a computer, CNC plasma, money, or any tools that I can't afford. So let's weld some other stuff on other parts of the rotisserie, I thought. Ha! <laughs> Silly me! I've been using one of those first generation Miller 211 MIG welders and have had nothing but problems since I first bought it in 2013. With inconsistent welds, frequent replacement of internal parts and such, my welder finally gave up. Yay! Luckily, all this happened right before my hip surgery in early December that put me out of commission anyway. So now I'll have more time to fix it once I'm back on my feet. So the entire month of December was at my dispense, so I decided to work on my business plan for my new electric vehicle conversion company, Ohm Electric. So, please send any venture capitalists my way. The biggest time sink this summer wasn't all that, it was actually dealing with customer service, and in particular Verizon. Here's a little background. The shop internet was spotty at best, and that caused big problems. 
the culprit, the stupid hotspot. Like the Microsoft Surface battery expanding, the hotspot did the same thing, only this time the case broke, which now prevented me from putting a new battery inside. You'd think that after paying a premium, you'd expect quality service, support, and hardware that actually works. But in a long-winded attempt to fix this hotspot, I wasted countless hours on the phone, online chat, visiting stores, kiosks, and whatever to explain the situation about 500 times, only to get this winner of a response. Little does Verizon know that I'm a craft wizard and creative AF, so I gathered my emergency crafting supplies and prepared myself with regular glue, glue stick, construction paper, scissors, band-aids, tongue depressors, googly eyes, and a shoe box. Be creative, they asked? Well, I made a diorama around my failed unit to help explain my story. It comes complete with my taped up Verizon hotspot stupidity shrine at the center. Here's how it all began. Hi, welcome to Verizon. I'm Veronica. Do you have an appointment with us today? Um, no. Hmm, as you can see, we're really busy. So, let me see if one of my associates or myself can assist you. Okay. So, it looks like everyone is busy with other clients, so I can try to help you. Let me go to my customer service application consultation safe space. How does that sound? Okay, what can I help you with today? My MiFi thing isn't working anymore. Let me pull up your account. Hmm, looks like your equipment is finally paid off and that's where I try to push you to buy new hardware and that you'll be paying for for the next few years. How does that sound? Uh, no. Great, well you have no choice since we're moving forward towards 5G and your hardware is no longer going to work anyway. Otherwise, you'll have to pay a cancellation fee. How does that sound? That's ridiculous, so I'm stuck buying a new hotspot? Absolutely. We'll just go ahead and charge your account and give you this jetpack. This is a hotspot. I can't use this. I'm going to have to keep it on the entire time. These aren't designed for that. Uh, I work at a cell phone company and I have no clue what you just said. Let me ask my technical advisor, Ronnie. See what he has to say. Uh, I just walk around with my face buried in a cell phone to make myself look busy. I'm going to be honest and say I can't provide any technical advice at this point whatsoever. That's great. Thanks, Ronnie. So, that's really your only option. How's that sound? I really have no choice now, do I? Well, you could just pay more and cancel your plan and go to a lesser quality service. How's that sound? Well, I, I guess I'm stuck with a new hotspot. Absolutely! Is there anything else I can help you with? Uh, yeah, I needed to remove another line off my plan. Oh! I'm sorry, we don't do that here. You'll have to call Verizon on that. How's that sound? You're a Verizon store. You can't go into my account and cancel a line? That's a great question. You just have to call our customer service line. How's that sound? Welcome to Verizon. Your call may be monitored for quality and training purposes. How can I help you today? You can say things like pay, Pay or pay. Cancel a line. I didn't quite hear that. Cancel a line. I still couldn't quite make that out. Can. Sell. A. Line. Great. I'll connect you with our automated service operator. Hi. Welcome to Verizon. How can I ha- Did my own cell phone service cut me off from their own customer service line?
So, I installed the new hotspot knowing that I have to keep this thing plugged in. Since most electronics aren't smart enough to stop charging when the battery's full, I had to use a timer to shut this thing off and turn it on again with the AC adapter after I did some quick math with the battery. This apparently overcycled the pack, causing the battery to purge not once, not twice, but three times, where finally the case broke and I wasn't able to put a new battery in. So, back to the Verizon store. Hi, welcome to Verizon. I'm Rachel. Do you have an appointment with us today? Um, no. Hmm, as you can see, we're really busy. So, let me see if one of my associates or myself can assist you. Okay. So, looks like everyone is busy with other clients, so I can try to help you. Let me go to my customer service application consultation safe space. How does that sound? Okay, how can I help you with today? This jetpack you sold me doesn't work and I need something that I can run continuously. There's no internet service where I am, so I have no other choice. That sounds fantastic. Let me go ahead and open up your account. Oh look, it looks like you're up for an upgrade. How's that sound? No, I don't need a new hotspot. I just need a damn battery for this piece of crap. Oh, sorry, we don't sell batteries for those. You don't sell batteries for the products you carry? Let me see if my technical associate has any ideas on where he can get one. How's that sound? Uh, I just walk around with my face buried in a cell phone to make myself look busy with no technical advice whatsoever. Hmm, have you tried a place like Radio Shack? Or, or better yet, you should try calling our customer service. They'll be more than happy to help you. How's that sound? Radio Shack? Really? So you can't sell me a replacement battery, you can't adjust my plan, you can't sell me the product that fits my needs. You guys are completely useless. That sounds great. Thank you for being such a valued Verizon customer. Have a great day. Well, that's what I've been up to over the last couple months, and until I finally swap over to Google Fi, the lesson after all this is, no matter whatever the hurdle or obstacle is, never give up. Just remember to load your trailer correctly, double check your grease caps, make sure your tires are inflated, and never lend your trailer out to friends.